I mean, people like just the amount of participation and the support, like people were really commenting in the chat for you last time. And like, it was just so beautiful. Like, I really, I'm glad you felt I mean, the people love. like. I did, I did. I was I'm like, this is such a loving practice. Tony Cade would be proud. <laughs> Listen, why was I just reading, um, rereading Black Women Writers at Work, uh, edited by Claudia Tate. And I just thought that like her piece was so, her interview was so great. And also Gwendolyn Brooks was like a little fiery with Claudia Tate. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's here's some folks coming in. Hello, everyone. How are y'all doing? I hope you're doing well. We're going to get started soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for the amazing Bria Johnson's second teaching on Black women care ethics, radical love in the anti-Black world. Please feel free to drop your name, your pronouns, where you're based in the chat, because we like to shout out folks. I see Amanda, hello from Ohio. Thank you so much for being here, Amanda. Um, Yeah, like I said, please feel free to drop your name, your pronouns, where you're based, and we're going to get started soon. Hi, from Michigan. I see Aubrey from Seattle. Hey, from Montreal. Wow, folks from Trinidad and Tobago, Portland, Seattle. Hey, let's see, Arizona, Riley from, hey, what's up from Scotland? Oh, that's so cool, Michelle. North Carolina, London, excuse me. Maryland, Charlottesville, Harlem. Seattle. Hey, another Londonite. Hey, Toronto. Kamani from Los Angeles. Thank you for being here. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you all so much. Hi, Jaden. How are you doing? Um, Peace, everyone. Scarlett, Callie. This is so beautiful. Yeah. Bria, you should be so excited. (laughs) Folks from Jamaica, Los Angeles, Houston. Toby from Chicago, Illinois. Thank you all so much for being here. We're going to get started in a moment. Um, Just waiting for folks to come in. Good afternoon from Kai. Hi, Kai in DC. Hey, y'all. Denise from London. Ty Wo from Cleveland, Ohio. Sheila from Frankfurt, Germany. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to wait for a few more moments. Hi, Mariana from Boston. Hey, (laughs) y'all. Camilla from Brussels, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Hello, Rafaela, Brazilian living in Portugal. Abby from Dakar, Senegal. Reem from Pennsylvania. Great, great, great. This is so beautiful. Um, And as y'all continue to come in to the event, please feel free to drop your name, your pronouns, and where you're based. I'm going to get started with the event so Bria can have the floor. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Swift. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Black Women Radicals. And if you're not familiar with Black Women Radicals, we are a Black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to uplifting and centering Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism around the world. So this teaching today is a part of Black Women Radicals School for Black Feminist Politics, which is the political education arm of Black Men Radicals, right? The purpose and the mission, mission, vision, values of the School for Black Feminist Politics is to expand the frame of reference of Black politics from uh, by empowering Black feminisms in the field, right? So we do that from multidisciplinary, intersectional, and transnational perspectives, right? And these teachings are free teachings led by amazing Black feminist activists, organizers, educators, you name it. They lead it and we pay uh, our black feminists to curate these teachings and they are free to the public. So thank you all so much for supporting. I have the amazing opportunity to introduce once again, Bria Johnson, who is leading a second teaching on black women care ethics, radical love in the anti-black world. And if you missed the first teaching, which was on June Jordan, the transformative teachings of June Jordan, you can watch that teaching on Black Women Radicals YouTube, right? And so this teaching on Black Women Care Ethics, Radical Love in the Anti-Black World focuses on how do we teach care and love in an anti-Black world? Is love possible? Does love matter? Together, Bria, will you will learn from Bria who will grapple the politics of love with the help of Black Women writers. 
questions include, is it possible to untether our understandings of care, love, and more from capitalist logics? Together, y'all will interrogate the utility of these words. So before I properly introduce our amazing guests, I just wanna say and establish that this is a safe space, right? So no transphobia, queerphobia, homophobia, anti-Blackness, uh, you name it, it will not be accepted. And so just please respect the space and our amazing guests. So about the amazing Bria Johnson. Bria M. Johnson, she, they pronouns, is a cultural worker and freelance writer living in Brooklyn, New York. Her work looks at modes of disposability, Black health, reproductive justice, radical love, and abolition. She's interested in the inner workings of Black women and girls and is finding a location for healing in the writers of Black folks globally. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to the wonderful Bria Johnson. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, I love Jamie a lot, y'all. They're a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. Black Women Radicals is a really incredible platform, and I'm so happy to be here with you all again today. I'm not exactly feeling well, so I won't be on camera today, but I am still with y'all. And with that, we can start. Yeah, we can begin. We can share the screen whenever you're ready, Jamie. One second, y'all. I'm about to have been, for some reason, it's not a lot of showing for me, but I will get it there, right? We're yeah. not going we're not going to let anti-Blackness ruin this teaching, y'all, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just one second, one second, one second. Here you go. Perfect. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can okay. see. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> like I said, um, I run a blog on Instagram, soon to be website, hopefully, called Black Reading to Heal. And the whole premise of this is kind of based on the works, the writings of Black women um, and Black queer folks generally. And it's about this idea that Bell Hooks talks about in Theory as Liberatory Practice, where she says that in theory, she found a location for healing, right? Um, she expands on that. And in her book, Remembering Rupture, she talks about the meaning of writing and she talks about why Black women write and writing as resistance and just the many, many, many things that come into writing, okay? And so basically what I'm seeking to do is use the writings of Black women um, across generations, across the diaspora to figure out the strategies necessary for our self-recovery, our rebellion, our healing, and our love and our care ethics, right? And so today what I'm trying to do is explore a part of this and take like one part of an essay that I'm working on and get us thinking more deeply about things like care, love, um, and, you know, just our emotions community and understand it in the context of um, capitalism and anti-Blackness, right? We can go to the next slide. It's a really complicated process, but again, I really wanted this particular teaching to be dedicated to the memory of Bell Hooks, who died last year. Um, All About Love, I think, is one of her most popular works, and I, I know a lot of people who, who credit Bell Hooks for their capacity to love or for new viewpoints on love. Um, I think I've read almost every Bell Hooks text and essay that is public at least. And so I would be lying if I did not say that she was a huge influence on my thinking, whether I'm disagreeing with her or agreeing with her, right? She is a huge um, influence on my Black feminism. So this one is really dedicated to her and we can keep it going. Um, so when I'm thinking about some of the particular Black writers who have given me language for understanding love, community, and care. I Some of these writers come to mind. Um, these are the most popular 
people, I believe, of today. So many of you may know who they are. We have Ella Baker, we have Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, June Jordan, we have Pearl, we have Tony Kay, we have Audrey, we have Nina Simone, and we have James Baldwin, because I always throw Baldwin in with the girls, okay? I do. Um, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, but there are some other scholars who I really want to hopefully, if you don't know them, introduce them to you all today. So people who I think we should read, um, Dr. Jamita Barlow, Dr. Jennifer Nash, Dr. Joy James, Belfina Yawan, Dr. Lamar Bruce. Okay, wonderful, wonderful writers, organizers, scholars, you name it, who I think also inform a lot of what we're going to talk about today and we can keep it going. All right, so the first question that I always get that I, I do love is what, what am I using as my definition for radical love? I'm gonna hold off on giving you all my personal definition, but I'm gonna give you the one that we used um, in, last, in the teaching two weeks ago, right? I'm gonna give you June Jordan's definition. So in this poem, she says, I will love who loves me. I will love as much as I am loved. I will hate who hates me. I will feel nothing for everyone oblivious to me. I will stay indifferent to indifference. I will live hostile to hostility. I will make myself a passionate and eager lover in response to passionate and eager love. I will be nobody's fool. I ground us in that definition of love for a very particular reason, because I'm trying to start us from a place where we do not accept this very docile, passive, um, maybe like agape definition of love that just makes us accept any and everything um, that makes us meet our oppression and our, you know, our abuse with care. That's not necessarily what I'm asking of us. So when I think about what it means to have radical love, June Jordan's poem comes to mind. We can go to the next slide. Um, so if you don't know what anti-Blackness is, a general definition is anti-Blackness is the name for a specific kind of racial and structural prejudice directed towards Black people. It's in a set of antagonisms and violence. It's the organizing principle of the world. We can keep pushing. Um, and then I always get the question, what are care ethics? what is a feminist ethic, right? Like, what do these words mean? Um, and what is their relationship to the care economy? Because you can't talk about care without underscoring the fact that there's actually a care economy for the type of labor and that we are going to kind of gloss over today. So care ethics emphasize our relationships to each other. It's about connection and it pushes back against the notion of individualism. Feminist ethics are about the care economy and call attention to the private sphere aimed to understand, criticize, and correct how gender operates within our moral beliefs and practices. Care work is defined broadly as work, work and relationships that are necessary for the health, welfare, maintenance, and protection of all people, young and old, able-bodied, disabled, and frail. The definition may seem broad, but care at its core is a very basic human need and necessity. Whether we know it or not, we all participate in providing care work, paid or unpaid, and in receiving care every day. By care economy, I am referring to the sector of the economy that is responsible for the provisions of care and services that contribute to the nurturing and reprodu reproduction of current and future populations. More specifically, it involves child care, elder care, education, health care, personal, social, and domestic services that are provided in both paid and unpaid forms and within formal and informal sectors. So what I want is for everybody to think about themselves for a second. Think about your life. And you can either say it in the chat or you can keep this answer to yourself. Where are you positioned in the care economy? Do you, are you paid or unpaid, right? Are you in a formal or informal sector? How are you giving and receiving care every single day? Where are you, right? Me, I'm an educator. That's the way that I provide care, but I'm also the eldest child, right? So I understand the unpaid labor 
<laughs> of nurturing and kind of assisting in the raising of children, right? I can position myself to that regard. And I understand the very systems that are in play that I am in direct relation to because of the type of labor that I provide every single day. I also know the company that I work for and the, and the ways in which my labor that is sometimes associated with my identity as a woman is exploited, right? I understand that too. So I think it's important to understand where you see yourself under this economy because two things are going to have to happen when we grapple with a radical understanding of care, right? We're going to have to change the way that we relate to each other on the individual scale. And we're also going to have to change the way that care is stabilizing the state and being extracted from us on the systemic scale, right? Both of these things are important. So anytime you have a self-help book that's just only about how about self-care in a manner that is individualistic, it's not doing what it needs to do, right? So that is not what the canon of Black feminist literature is seeking for us to do. I know we've seen this, people say this all the time, but self-care is beyond a face mask, it's beyond a participation in Black girl luxury, it's beyond any of the propaganda that we're seeing on the internet right now, right? Like the idea of care, is something that needs a lot of our scholarly attention right now. I'm seeing lots of wonderful things in the chat. Um, yes, we can keep it pushing. Whew. Yeah, so for folks who just want to really understand the care economy, we can play this mini video just so that you have a better understanding. Reality. Throughout the course of our lives, each and every one of us will rely on the care of others. As the world's population grows, and as it ages, so will the demand for care. Mothers, fathers, and other family members are most often the primary caregivers. But children, especially girls, also help to care for the youngest and oldest members of their families and help with household chores. The responsibility for care sits mainly on the shoulders of women and girls, and often on those from disadvantaged racial and ethnic groups. Domestic workers play a key role in caregiving. Often they are poorly paid and operate outside the formal economy. Girl domestic workers have less access to education and see their own opportunities severely hampered as a result. Migrant domestic workers leave their families behind in search of work, often displacing care to other family members. And while they may benefit from moving from rural to urban areas or to different countries, they need to be aware of their rights and protected from exploitation. Formal paid jobs in care services are mostly in early childhood education, social work, healthcare services, disability care, or long-term care for the elderly. But care work is undervalued all over the world, and even when paid, is often underpaid. Where there are challenges, there are opportunities. The care economy of the future should generate more decent jobs in public and private sectors, that could be well remunerated. Care cooperatives, like domestic workers' co-ops or daycare, set up by the parents themselves, are growing. In seizing this chance to create care jobs, we can also smooth the way for many more women to join the workforce in all fields and contribute their talent to the social and economic growth of their countries. But to do so, Care contributions need to be measured, recognized, and valued. Caregivers should also have a voice and be represented in decision-making. Care needs to be redistributed fairly. Getting more men into decent care jobs will also promote gender equality. And it needs to be reduced by a better investment in social and housing. All right. 
Thank you. So I just wanted folks to kind of have more of an understanding of what is defined as the care economy. There are many, many things in that video that I don't exactly agree with. And, you know, all of its conclusions about what needs to occur aren't exactly my standpoint. But that's not the point of the video. I just wanted to situate you in what folks are talking about when they say a care economy. And I want to emphasize the fact that it is an economy, right? Very, very important because love is also an economy. Um, you have scholars like Carol Gilligan who argued that women's moral development can be characterized by responsibility and care, right? Remember that definition as I keep situating you in more of what Black feminists are saying. And we can go to the next slide. So, so one of my favorite scholars is um, Dr. Jennifer Nash, and she wrote a beautiful essay called Love Politics, where she takes you through a kind of genealogy of love, right? The writings of Black women that are dealing with either directly or indirectly with love, and the fact that for us, love has always been deeply interconnected with political resistance, or it's just been political because of the very nature of our lives as Black women, right? And so she gives this beautiful assessment where she says that Black feminism's pleas for loves as a, are, a, are a significant call for ordering the self and transcending the self, a strategy for remaking the self and for moving beyond the limitations of selfhood. I really like this definition, and I think I use it a lot in trying to explain to people what I believe we have to do. And Tony K. Bambara um, was very good at telling us that our political resistance and our liberation was first going to start with the self, right? She really did emphasize that there was a changing change from within that just had to occur in order for anything to be possible. And so what Jennifer Nash has found is that, you know, you begin with Trent with reordering the self, um, but you can't stay there. And so I think that's where a lot of people get caught up. A lot of people get caught up in this idea that, OK, I, the individual, do need to change. Right. But they stay in the I. Um, and there are too many limitations of selfhood, right? But you still do have to do that inner work. Um, I think that that is a part of anything and has to be a part of any movement, which is very, very, very important. Um, and that's why I think understanding our notions of love, care, intimacy, these words that we just like to throw out as if we inherently understand them it's going to be really important to take them up seriously in a Black feminist context, right? What is your definition for love? What is your definition for care? What is your definition for intimacy? You really need to take out a journal and write it down. What is your definition? And what a lot of folks are going to find, maybe not on this call, because most of you are probably more familiar with something a little bit deeper, but what a lot of people will find is that they cannot explain these terms without some type of capitalist market logic governing whatever they feel like these terms mean. That's really important. If you were here for the June Jordan teaching, you're going to remember when I told you that June Jordan was very specific about language, right? She asked us the question, what language have we taken on that is not our own? She asked us, what language is governing the way that we are being in the world, because she understood that the language is not our own, right? June Jordan said that her, the power that her father had over her mother first began with the language that he spoke over her, right? So language is so important and black women writers understand that. So a part of reordering the self is going to be giving yourself new language, new definitions, new understandings, or just reclaiming ones that you do not remember, right? We do memory work. Delfina always say, says that, right? We do the work of remembering. We do the work of memory. So I am really interested in how folks are coming to understand. Oh, someone said, can I ask those questions again? Yeah, what is your definition for love, for care, and for intimacy? Define it. I want to know, what do you define those things as, right? Like, I really want to know because I want you to know. Because the problem is that we believe that these terms are innate. 
We believe that we innately know how to do these things. I don't. I don't think that. I think that care and love and intimacy are all skills that we have to build up like everything else that we have to learn how to do. Oh, goodness. Okay, we can keep it pushing. I'm trying to read the chat um, and stay along with you all. Yes. Yeah, so it's a part of reordering the self and moving beyond the limitations of selfhood. So it's a two-part thing. Um, so there are many definitions for love. Joy James likes to work in the context of something called revolutionary love, where she says revolutionary love is difficult, difficult to define. It's distinct from personal and familial love. It originates from a desire for the greater good that entails radical risk-taking for justice. Revolutionary love is not romantic or charming. It's ne it neither romanticizes nor projects celebrities or, or politics as, as surrogates for radical activism. I think that that is also a really important definition, right? So. A little bit earlier, I gave you a June Jordan kind of definition for love. Then we move forward to more of a Jennifer Nash kind of understanding of Black feminism's pleas for love. And then here we kind of have Joy James, who is interested in something like a bit beyond that, beyond both of those things. And it's a revolutionary love. One of the things that I find to be a bit central across all three definitions is that there's gonna come a time and a place where you have to move beyond yourself and you have to seek something that goes beyond just some romance and something charming. I think that that's really important. And it's like one way to break free of this capitalist, individualist, individualistic understanding of love. I'm talking so much, but it's okay. All right, we can go to the next um, to the next slide. So in the essay, um, as Jennifer Nash is talking more and more about all the writings that she has read and the genealogy of love and Black women's writings, um, she says that love practitioners, that's what we'll call them, they imagine a world ordered by love, by radical embrace of difference, by a set of subjects who work on and against themselves to work for each other. This dreaming of, of course, does not suspend labor. Black feminist love, politic, love politics practitioners have always been attached to the idea that the radical future requires certain kinds of very hard work. Pushing beyond our investments in selfhood and sameness and reaching towards collectivities and possibilities. Nor does, nor does this vision neglect the host of ways that power and structures of domination work on and against bodies um, in, in spectacular ways. I love this summary. Um, I think it's telling us very, 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 very concinctly what we need to do. And so one, one thing that stands out here is that it's saying that we have to have a radical embrace of difference, right? So it's not based on the fundamental investment in sameness. If you go through Audre Lorde's work, there is so many moments where she talks to us about our ability to embrace radical, non-dominant difference, right? non-dominant interdependent difference, I think is the term that she uses specifically. And so what that means to me is that instead of ordering ourselves around this idea that I am going to look at you or a person and immediately go to what we have in common, I, I, I wanna switch us to a place where we kind of do the opposite and we hone in on the very fundamental things that make us different whether it's ability level, gender, sexuality, class, whatever, we know that there are grave differences between us. And so what I believe that a lot of capitalist logic requires, it requires us to search for sameness. And in searching for sameness, we think that that makes us more universal. But to me, what it actually does is it makes us more restrictive, right? It makes us draw boundaries that are actually borders. 
It makes us limit our capacity for who we choose to love and why we love them. And it makes us um, not be expansive in our idea of community or who we need to care for. And I think that that's why you have things like, um, no, never mind. I was really going to wild out. But yeah, so I really hope that y'all are rocking with me because I'm giving you a lot all at once. But <laughs> I think it's really important to be able to engage difference in very profound ways and understand the ways in which capitalism wants us to do the opposite. There is this part in um, Sisters of the Yam where Bell Hooks goes, y'all know she, she was no stranger to saying outlandish things that would have you like, wait, what? She says something like, you are so trained to be afraid of what is unfamiliar to you, but the data is saying you will be killed or harmed by someone you know. So what is this instant rejection of something that is different from you or something that you do not know, right? Like that's just reinforcing what the state wants you to be fearful of, right? But that's not even the very nature in which you are actually being harmed by. You aren't being harmed by, you know, these other states. You don't need to be protected by these so-called other countries. That's the fundamental basis for imperialist propaganda, right? your harm doer is actually America for those of us who are here, right? So <laughs> when we understand kind of like these guiding principles of love and difference and all of that, then we can really see the types of things that are governing us. Oh, baby. Now we can go to the next slide. So, um, so then we get into kind of like the problem with care. So one thing I'm not going to do with you all is sit on this call and pretend like care is just this beautiful thing. Um, I'm not going to get on this call and romanticize care, right? Care is necessary. A care ethic is necessary. And I believe that we have to do it no matter what. There's always going to be some type of care that is needed um, in our communities. However, there are so many problems with care. Um, Lucille Clifton, um, a wonderful writer, she has this quote where she says, you know, true, this isn't paradise, but each day something that loves us tries to save us. And I think that that is beautiful. I also think that we're going to have scholars like Joy James, who give us the captive maternal to talk about the ways in which our care and our labor and our love for our communities is being used to stabilize, to, to restabilize the state, right? Being used against us, right? I mean, Joy James said it very plainly. You're, you're realistically, as a Black woman, uh, you're not going to let your community die, right? Like you're not going to withhold your care because you know that it is the very thing that is keeping people alive, right? You know that, and the state knows that too. Remember when June Jordan told us that, you know, our movement had to be free of enemy assessment? It is not. They fully understand our care ethic. They have an assessment of it. They know that when we experienced organized abandonment or state neglect, they know exactly or precisely which people will step in and try to supplement that care. They know that. That's why they don't have to, you know, do that, right? They know who will do it. And oftentimes the people who provide the care look a certain way, right? Or they are from a certain group or population of, that is marginalized, right? We know that. And I want to even push us further to think about you know, our own lives, maybe it's in our friendship groups, maybe it's in our families, but there's a reason why overwhelmingly people who are not thin, people who are dark skinned, people who are not able bodied, right? People who are do not have citizenship, it is a reason why they almost always are assuming more of the care, labor, or even the deeper care ethic than other people. As someone who is in a dominant group or a group with more power, you know the type of labor you do not have to participate in because consciously and unconsciously, you know who will supplement that work for you. That is just the goddamn truth, right? We know these things. And so 
in order to talk about care, we have to talk about it in the context of like, who care is killing, okay? And, and overwhelmingly, care is killing the people who were already being killed. And you all know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Black women. I'm talking about trans people. I'm talking about qu queer people. I'm talking about disabled people. I'm talking about people who don't live in the US, right? Like care is only killing some of us, right? That is really important. So we cannot romanticize this idea of care. And so when I say love and care, I'm not talking about this woohoo, ha ha, like agape shit. I'm talking about like actual work that is almost death dealing in a sense that I am trying to get us to reorder so that we can stay alive and resist and have rebellion. Um, and so again, I'm encouraging everybody to have their own understanding of the captive maternal. I can't go into that today. Um, but remember when I told you that Carol Gilligan, who wrote a, a book that I can't remember right now, but she's not Black, so it's okay, argued that women's moral development can be characterized by responsibility and care, right? Our moral development. What does that say about our relationship to extractive labor when our morality and our sense of identity is all pent up in this idea that we are responsible and we must care for things, right? Now, I want to be very clear. There are so many different notions of femininity or nurture or responsibility. And I want to be very clear that I am, for the purpose of this presentation, talking about a more Western, white supremacist, capitalist, imperialistic, patriarchal understanding of these things, okay? I know there are different definitions. So before we go into that, I'm specifically talking about this. Um, and so, you know, that care and that love that we have for ourselves, it provides comfort and nurture, and but it also stabilizes the state, right? It also can kill us sometimes. And I think that we cannot act like those things don't exist. But we also know that the very harms that happen when we like withhold our care. And I wanna give you all very tangible examples of this. You have black women in communities who are grandmothers who no longer want to do or assume the role of respon being responsible for children. They don't wanna raise any more children, right? But they understand that if they withdraw that care they understand what will happen to their grandchildren. And that's kind of what I think Joy James is getting at. And that's what I'm getting at, right? That care can sometimes be violent and it can sometimes be something that is death work for some of us because we're doing it under capitalism and patriarchy and anti-Blackness. Very, very important. That's why you have so many people. I think there was literally just a viral tweet where somebody was like, when they say it takes a village, they're just talking about women, right? <laughs> so on one hand, we want this interconnected community understanding. We want to get ourselves back to interdependence. On the other hand, we know who is not assuming labor in our communities. And so that is the grave tension here. So many of us want to just opt out of care altogether because of how violent it feels, but we can't do that, right? We still have a responsibility to each other. We still are a collective. So what we need, in my opinion, is a stronger care ethic. And we also need one that is starting to teach us actually what do we need to do to change the balances of power, the scales of power, so that we're caring for each other differently. The chat is jumping. I'm gonna try to look at it. Um, yes, yeah, grandmothers are dying because of lack of rest, absolutely. Um, yeah, your memory is sacred. You remember the names, yes. Um, she, somebody says she's not black, so it's okay. Ah, I did say that. Um, where does the reference to agape come from? So I think agape is just this kind of like very um, popular understanding of love where we're just supposed to be all loving. It's like the highest form of love that a person can get to. And oftentimes for me, it's deployed in a very depolitical way that I think kind of, it, it makes it very compelling for you to just take on this love ethic that's like, I love everybody, I love everybody the same, I'm all loving, I'm doing God's work. 
I don't got time for that. I'm not really interested in that. Um, and it definitely is a Christian value. I think it can be very harmful um, in the ways that it is deployed, especially in the church. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'm like, hold on, where are we? <clears throat> So yeah, so one of the books that I really do love is um, Sisters of the Yam. And I love this book. Bell Hooks dedicated this book to Tony K. Bambara. And Tony K. Bambara, I believe she used to run these um, like support groups for Black women. And they were called the Sisters of the Yam. And after she passed, Bell Hooks comes up to you know honor her memory and she writes sisters of the am and i think that that's um one of the ways that we do a care ethic as black women when we keep our work alive um and so in this book and in uh, radical love we all know that bell hooks is trying to get us to have a more profound understanding of love and so one of the things she says is that remember care is a dimension of love but, simp but simply giving care does not mean that we are loving. And so I love that because I agree. I think a lot of us use care and love interchangeably. I don't find that to be necessary. Just because I care for you or show you care does not mean that I love you. And just because I just because I love you doesn't necessarily mean that I feel like I need to know you, right? So really trying to grapple with those differences, but also understanding that just because we do the work of care does not mean we are doing the work of love. Just because you accept your mother's labor does not mean you are loving your mother back. Just because you accept the labor of your partner and the care of your partner does not mean that you are loving to your partner. These are very important and these are things that can help us have different understandings of emotional equilibrium and reciprocity, right? Understanding the difference between being caring and loving can help us get there. Um, and I don't really know why I have a June Jordan quote just in there. I think I just love her and that's why it's there. Um, and then Audrey Lord as well, but very, very great quotes that you can read on your own time. <laughs> what are y'all saying? Yes, just because I care don't mean I love you. Just because I love you doesn't mean I care, right? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, there are so many components that make up love. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, okay, so one of the things that Bell Hooks <clears throat> says is that a commitment to a love ethic transforms our lives by offering us a different set of values to live by. In large and small ways, we make choices based on the belief that honoring openness and personal integrity need to be expressed in public and private decisions. I choose to move to a small city so that I could live in the same area as family, even though it was not as culturally desirable as the place I left, as the place I left. Friends of mine live at home with aging parents, caring for them, even though we have enough money to go elsewhere. Living by a love ethics, we learn to value loyalty and a commitment to sustain bonds over material advancement. While careers and money making remain important agendas, they never take precedence over valuing and nurturing human life and well being. That is so important, right? And how many of us get that type of understanding of love? How many of us grew up with that as a definition of what love should be? I don't. I don't think how many of us have ever seen anybody say something like that in their Tinder bio? Like I, I'm going to keep giving y'all practical examples so I can talk about the very nature in which we have truly terrible understandings of love and care. Right. A lot of people for a lot of people until they read Sisters of the Yam or until they read All About Love, they never had this definition of love or or even care. Right. Even though those are two different things or the ethics of it all. Um, and so that leads me to the next slide. Ooh. You can go to the next slide, Jamie. Yeah, so that leads me to going back to like how I asked you all <clears throat> to ask yourselves, how do we understand love, care, and intimacy? And I think my next question is, do we believe these things are possible under capitalism, patriarchy, and anti-Blackness? And so 
This is a question that I struggle with every single day because there are so many moments where I want to say no. <laughs> I think that we have a very somatic feeling that shows up in our bodies for people, but I'm not sure if that's love or care. I think we feel things. I think we feel very strong things. But if I were going to use the definitions of love and care that I just provided you all with, I'm also going to be bold and say that a majority of the world has never even experienced those things, right? And so I always struggle with the fact of like, am I telling people that they have never been loved? And I think the bell hooks grapples with that and all about love too, where she's kind of just like, if we tell people that love and abuse cannot coexist, for a lot of people, their immediate pushback to that is that they really don't want to have to face that there's a possibility that they may have never been loved, right? So there's this tension between if everything is guided or kind of underscored by capitalism or capitalist market logics, right? then what we're saying is that the true nature and essence of love or the possibility of love or the, or the broader capacity of love and care is something that maybe none of us have actually received, right? And so that's a really, really hard realization to sit in, but it provides a lot of space for us to do new things, okay? So maybe perhaps we're clearing out an old understanding of love and care and intimacy, but we're making space for something a lot better. And I think when I think about it in that way, it makes it a bit, it makes it a bit easier. There are some people who will disagree with me profoundly and they're like, absolutely, we have love. Absolutely, we have care. Absolutely, we have intimacy. That's how we have survived as Black people or people of color or people of any marginalized group, right? And, um, I respect that difference. And I think that that tension is what we should still move through. Um, but it's important to name and to challenge because for me, love is not innate. And if it's not innate, then I'm going to question if any of us have it. Um, and so remember that in Bell Hooks says that embracing a love ethic means that we utilize all the dimensions of love. And again, she says that love is care, commitment, trust, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. And she says that we can successfully do this only by cultivating awareness. Being aware enables us to critically examine our actions to see what is needed so that we can give care, be responsible, show respect, and indicate a willingness to learn. Understanding knowledge as an essential element of love is vital because we are, we are bombarded with daily messages that tell us love is about mystery, about that which cannot be known, right? And so I think that that's really, really important. Um, let me see what folks are saying. Yes, so I'm saying there's always transaction. Um, what else are people saying? Someone are saying love is not innate. Um, yeah, we're having, we're having great, really great discussion. I'm really loving it. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So, um, I always say his name wrong, but Eric Frome, he was a world renowned writer and scholar, and he has a book where he's talking about love. And so a lot of people, um, a lot of the book, he is telling us in some ways that how capitalism really, 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 really um, is so <laughs> innately currently a part of our understandings of love. Um, and so one of my favorite quotes is this one right here where he's like, you can't love, we can only exchange, right? So he's saying that we exchange personality packages for hope for a hope for a fair bargain, right? So thus two persons thus fall in love when they feel they have found the best object available on the market, considering the limitations of their own exchange value. I wanna say that again. So this man is telling us because of capitalism, right? We are not doing love. What we are actually doing is exchanging personality packages. 
And I think that if we really were to look at these mainstream dating platforms, we see that, right? We are putting our personalities into a small package and we're trying to exchange them and we're trying to find the best thing on the market that we can get. And for a lot of us, we understand the limits of our own values, right? So some Black women understand or try to overcome the limit of their own perceived value, okay? And so we, we try to do that. And so that's why we show up to, you know, dating situations and we ask really fucking ridiculous questions like, what do you bring to the table, right? We show up and our starting point is things like, I will not date anybody under this salary. We show up and we say things like, oh, I'm looking for a person who's interested in this particular type of thing or who acts like this, you know? Like, this is why we're having so many mainstream debates over money, over appearance, over, you know, what job profession you have, right? Because we are exchanging personality packages. That is not love. And then on the other side of things, if it is becoming increasingly difficult to live your life on a one person salary, then we also still have to understand the limitations of what we are calling love, right? And so when our very understanding of love because of the state is limited, and instead what the state wants you to think about is that love is only the parent to child relation. Love is only the husband to wife relation. Love is only the nuclear family relation. Love is only the biological fam familial relation, right? Like our definitions get more confining and more confining and more confining because when you do it this way, it's easier to exchange the packages, right? So it's easier to exchange the family name as a package in love when you restrict your understandings of love. These are the ways in which I'm trying to get people to understand it's a possibility that what you think is love is not love at all. It's a possibility that you actually do not understand anything about intimacy. Because what you are looking for and what your language is revealing is that you want to make a fucking stock investment, right? That's what you really want. That's why we get people who say things like, I am afraid to invest in this. I am afraid to give in this because I do not know what I'm going to get out of this. These are capitalist market logics at play. And for gender marginalized people, we also do this because we understand that the stakes are far too high for us, right? And so we end up participating in this because we're trying to save ourselves, right? And so we get into these situations and we come withholding with our packages because we understand what the stakes are like. We understand that the harm, who's more likely in this dynamic to receive harm, right? We understand more likely who's gonna have their care extracted from. So, you know, I'm not saying that all of us do this because of some, you know, evil. We're making negotiations under the systems that we live in. And when we understand that these things govern our understandings of love, then we know the type of work we got to do to get out of this. And so what I'm hoping for is that I'm just trying to get people to a place where they at least acknowledge that this is occurring. Um, and so, yeah, we see love as a transactional deal. It's a trade, right? Everything is a trade. And when we see everything as a trade, we don't understand intimacy because we're looking for very specific forms of reciprocity. So we don't understand why we are giving and giving and giving and giving love and we're not getting anything back. And perhaps it's because we're having such conflicting definitions of what care, love, and intimacy means. So because you are taught to see a market logic, you do not see what is actually being given to you. Or because we live under capitalism, your needs, your material needs are not being met. And because your material needs are not being met, the somatic response in your body is that your emotional needs are not being met and that you are also not being loved, right? 
both of those things I think happen simultaneously and make it so fucking difficult to love. Um, And then on the other side of things, we just have to think about the fact that love within itself is a marketplace, right? Love sells. The reason why everybody loves all about love, the reason why that book is one of Bell Hook's most popular books is not because it is her most profound work. It is not because it's her best work. It's because it's about love and love sells. The reason we gravitate towards her work in this, but not things like teaching to transgress is because it is about love and love sells. So do even within trying to reframe and revolutionize our understandings of love, we still fall victim to particular markets for love, right? Like it is unfortunate, but that's the thing. Love is the thing that captures all of our attentions innately. And we almost always want it to be about dating. And that's why for a lot of us, and even for myself, when I start speaking about love, I could be generalizing, but folks will immediately think I'm talking about partnership, right? I could be talking about the love of children. I could be talking about the love of nature. I could be talking about so many things, but the brain goes partnership. When I say market exchange, I'm not just talking about dating. We market exchange with our children. We, we want to personality package our children, right? We want to do that for everything, right? It's not limited to just romantic engagements at all. The way people talk about their kids, the way the reasons why people want to have kids, that is not exempt from market logic. And, and we got to understand that. Our domination over children is another market logic, right? Okay, so I just want to reinforce that so folks don't walk away from today being like, okay, yeah, I, I just want to be a better partner. That's that's not all I'm saying to you. Um, so for the sake of time, we can keep it pushing for the next slide. So here is a quote from Audre Lorde, where again, so now that we've kind of talked about the pitfalls of care and love and all the issues, We still have to do the work of reordering the self. We still have to do the work of changing our definitions of these things so that we can change our behaviors, right? And so what I like about what Audre Lorde says in um, Sister Outsider is she is, she's not going to lie about the ill, the, the horrible ways that sometimes Black women treat each other. And I think for my, some fellow Black women on the call, you know, we have these secret conversations where we talk about, you know, some of our most diff- difficult work experiences being with other Black women, right? Like, we have to talk about the different intercommunal violences that we experience or enact on each other. We have to be honest, because here is where the work is going to have to happen. Here is where the shift is going to have to happen. And so she says, We have to consciously study how to be tender with each other until it becomes habit, because what is native has been stolen from us, the love of Black women for each other. But we can practice being gentle with each other by being gentle with that piece of ourselves that was the harshest, the hardest to hold. By giving more to the brave, bruised girl child within each of us, by expecting a little less from her, from her efforts to excel. We can love her in the light as well as in the darkness. Quiet her frenzy towards perfection and encourage her attentions towards fulfillment. As we aim, as we arm, encourage her attentions towards fulfillment. As we arm ourselves with ourselves and each other, we can stand toe to toe inside that right, right, rigorous loving and begin to speak the impossible or what has always seemed like the impossible to one another. The first step towards genuine change. Eventually, if we speak truth to each other, it will become unavoidable to ourselves. I really like this. Um, I think Audre Lorde is trying to get us to do a lot of things. She's trying to get us, she says it very clearly, to learn how to love each other as Black women. And yeah, someone said this is shadow work. And so here is where the utility of tenderness comes through. And so when do we deploy tenderness to each other? When do we deploy it to ourselves? Um, I love how she's speaking of inner child healing. Again, that's that reordering of the self that um, 
Black feminists are always telling us that we got to do, right? A lot of the times, um, the work is is, is going to start with us. It's going to start with that. If you can't be tender to yourself, you probably can't be tender to other Black women. Um, and if you can't be tender to other Black women, I doubt that you can be tender to anything. Very important things to have. Um, and so you can go to the next slide. Uh, oh my goodness. Sorry, y'all. My computer is always bugging every single time. Give me one second so I can make sure I see my notes. Here we go. Okay, so it doesn't want me to see my notes. Wait a minute. Hold on. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm going back to this because even Bell Hooks understands that Black women are socialized to assume the role of caregiver. We are socialized into this. We're socialized into this labor. I told you that Carol said that women, women's moral development was one of responsibility and care. And here comes Bell Hooks saying, yeah, you're, as Black women, you're socialized into caregiver. And our passive acceptance of this role is a critical barrier to our self-recovery. If it, being a caregiver is in deep conflict or not conflict, I'll use her term, is a critical barrier to our self-recovery, that poses a really big problem for the entire community, right? We still have to be caregivers. We still have to have a care ethic. But how can we do this in ways where it's no longer a barrier to our self-recovery? I am still struggling with a profound answer to this question, right? And so today I can't really present to you all this like five-step plan where this becomes achievable. It, it is very, very hard. And so figuring, I think the question we have to ask ourselves as Black women, starting with our individual lives and as Black people starting with our individual lives and as marginalized people starting with our individual lives is, what in your life is happening right now with the manner in which you are deploying care and, and love that is conflicting with your self-recovery? And if it's conflicting with your self-recovery, we got to figure something out. We got to reorder something. We got to figure out how we can change this, right? These questions are going to require community support they're going to require a lot of changes in how we care for each other and the, and the systems that we create to hold each other so that we can recover. Um, and then like, what are the recipes for healing? And I, I really love this passage from Sisters of the Yam where Bell Hooks is talking to somebody who is in a lot of pain this person is, is, is just in a lot, is experiencing immense grief and turmoil, right? And she says, you know, I wanted to remind her of the recipes of healing to give her my own made on the spot remedy for easing her pain. I tell her, get a pen, stop crying so you can write this down and start working on it tonight. My, mem my remedy is long, but the last item on the list says, when you wake up and find yourself living someplace where there's nobody you love and trust, no community, it's time to leave town, to pack up and go. You can even go tonight. And where you need to go is any place where there are arms that can hold you and that will not let you go. What I love about this is that this could be so broad, right? This could mean so many different things. And so the question remains, where can we go where the arms can hold us and not let us go, right? Like when we find, when we realize that we have never been loved or we have never been cared for in a way that is not the capitalist logic that I just told you all about, then we have to ask the question, okay, so where can we go? For some of us, the sad answer is gonna be nowhere but we don't have to get stuck in that despair because then the work becomes creating that space for yourself. And then for the rest of us, we're going to find that where we want to go might look so fundamentally different from where our, what our life looks like now. So that means that for some of us who think we, we have no love in the current romantic partnership that may, we may be in, for some of us, that means that it's time to pack up and go to friendship and order your life around that. For some of us, 
it's going to mean that we do not feel the love in the family dynamic that we are in. So we're going to have to go pack up and go somewhere else to arms that can hold us, right? Very, very important. And I think when we start thinking about love in this manner, I'm going to go ahead and say that we're just going to fundamentally start shifting and moving away from, you know, the bullshit nuclear family structure or, you know, any type of um, preconceived idea of orientation of community that is actually not serving us. I just said a mouthful. Um, and there was something else that I wanted to read to you all. Okay, so yeah, so I think these are so many ways in which Black women writers are trying to teach us new ways of being. And um, there's a scholar who in the book, what is this book called? Ah, uh, yeah. In the book, Nobody Knows the Troubles I've Seen, the Emotional Lives of Black Women, um, the writer tries to, you know, give us more characteristics of things like healthy relationships and it's listed that, you know, a healthy relationship has to have the following mutual respect, honesty, trust, empathy, boundaries, space for individuality, intimacy, open communication, support, and safety. And so for me, if we can think about those characteristics of healthy relationships and apply them to everything, let's start them with our relationships to children because we don't never want to start there. How could that fundamentally help us change the world? That's a question that I'm always asking myself. Um, if love is the thing that folks are obsessed with, whether they acknowledge it or not, then love has to become a site of like deep, 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 deep reordering and rebellion. Um, and so I want us to kind of set these intentions to reclaim what these words mean to find their meaning in the writings of, of Black women um, and to really be serious about undertaking Black feminisms in a way where we are committed to reordering the self and moving beyond the self. And then hopefully we get to a place where we can undertake that revolutionary um, love definition where we go up even more. That is my hope for spaces like this. And that's why I think it's so important to keep defining care. And it's so important to keep talking about this, right? And so um, I am going to end there. And I will pass it back to Jamie. But thank you all for being so present in the chat for this. So sorry, my computer was acting up. Can anyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. My screen is going. One second. You just preached, or I shouldn't say preach. You just taught about love, Bria, and now my screen is going all over the place. Okay, one second. The anti-blackness, the anti-black world didn't want us to hear this. <laughs> Because my screen is acting up. I want to say we need a monthly container, to be honest. Like <laughs> meet up with you, Bree. <laughs> I'm working on no, it. I'm working on it. <laughs> seriously, it was, I mean, I was over here. I was afraid people were going to hear me in the background being like, mm, mm, like you were just really taking us there. And I even, you're centering of children that's what bell hooks did that's what june jordan did that's what i don't know it was just so much to take in and i see that people are having um you know want to know if the webinar will be available and it will most certainly will be available on black radicals youtube and as my computer does what it's doing um i just want to make sure that people know that the webinar will be available right on um, Black Mer Radicals YouTube. So make sure to subscribe and follow. Um, and we're also going to have a Q&A section with Bria shortly, but just really appreciative Bria of just your offering, right? Um, and your offerings both in this first, both in the, with this teaching, but also the second teaching. 
um, you really hit on some subjects that even myself, I'm still grappling with. So I'm just really appreciative of all that you do and the amazing, uh, I don't know, you just, you're a wonderful, you're just wonderful uh, uh, communicator. And this, these teachings have been more than amazing. So thank y'all so much. My computer's still acting up, but guess what? I remember some of the questions from the top of my head, right? So one of the questions was about clarification on death work, Bria. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you didn't mind discussing um, what that meant. Yeah, so um, there are many definitions for that. So I'm not, when I say death work, I'm not um, necessarily, talk. I'm not talking about death doulas. That's, you know, completely different work. Um, I think the term that I use is kind of more like death dealing a bit. And so for me, I'm taking up an understanding of extractive care or um, care labor that puts us in an early grave, right? That contributes to our stress, that contributes to our health problems, um, that that causes so much violence in our community, right? That's what I mean. Um, so, un, so not trying to romanticize this idea of the fact that some of us are, you know, described as being more or better able to provide care and love, right? Not innately seeing that as a good thing because I understand the other side of it. And that's what I mean. Thank you so much for that clarification, Bria. I just want to read some of the comments. Um, someone said, I have my church for today. Thank you. This was so heart and mind opening. This was excellent. Thank you for walking us through this. Absolutely amazing. Um, here listening in with my lover and we are grateful for this. Thank you, Bri and Black Mar Radicals. Just like really, uh, someone wrote, I literally cried just now. I really, really appreciate, appreciate these teachings. I'm learning so much and it's helpful in my self-healing journey. So thank you, Bria. Wow. Um, that's just so, 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 so beautiful. Um, and so the next question, um, someone asked, asking as a writer, you have read so many wonderful Black feminist texts. Do you think that there's a room to expand our writings on Black feminism? For context, I write primarily in fiction and poetry. There's already so much writing out there, and I often wonder if it is a worthy pursuit to keep writing about Black, li about liberation, excuse me, as a Black woman. Thank you. Oh, yes, there is, there is room for it all. We are never done writing, and um, I love how Bell Hooks is always talking to us about the very, like, inherently political nature. Well, not, I don't want to say inherent. Nothing is inherent. We have to make things political, but... To answer your question, keep writing. Absolutely keep doing it. Um, you never know who you're going to reach. And even if you don't reach anybody, the very nature of writing can be a healing modality. And that's something that I am trying to teach people. So it is writing that can be a function of healing. And it is reading that can also be a function of healing, right? So even for that potential purpose, always keep writing. And there's probably a genre that you can you can explore even beyond what you even know right now. So keep writing. Yes, yes, yes. Please keep writing. There, like Bria said, there's so much to be explored and just be encouraged that what you are doing um, is needed and matters. So thank you, Bria, for that. Um, someone asked, in the midst of the pandemic where formal and informal care workers have been especially sapped and depleted of their energy, health, and in many cases, their lives, and where an uncaring government, both federal and local, is clearly not operating from a love ethic, how do we convince others of the need for collectivity? The question of convincing um, is really, really, really difficult. I think that what it's gonna take, what it's actually gonna take is something beyond convincing. Um, I, I don't think that revolutions or even change takes a wide part of the population. I think it just takes a dedicated subset of the population, right? And so for me, I think I'm at the place where 
I don't know how much more convincing we can do, but I do know that we can organize. And I do know that we can find various ways to, whether it's strike or organize or where we can't participate in or where we can create something different. You know, folks are creating different co-ops here and there. Um, Folks are really just trying to do other things because they understand the very nature of how we've been exploited. And so I'm interested in kind of how we can shift our participation into more of those things. But if a global pandemic didn't convince people, I don't know what will do it. And I wanna be honest about the tension of that answer. So yeah, it's like I have an answer and then I don't. Mm. If a global pandemic hasn't convinced people. That is so, wow. Thank you for sharing that, Bria. Um, And thank you for um, the question because it was such an excellent question. Um, So another question, Bria, is in Alice Walker's definition of womanism, she talks about encouraging us to love men and encourage wholeness. I was wondering if you could share your feelings on how you think Black women especially can begin to expand our definition of care to include men when so many of us, namely women, have faced gender, gender-based gender violence. How does this work of caring for men showing up in your own life? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question because I think that women, Black women in particular, already do care for men. I think this is included already. Um, I think that, you know, the difficulty is not in caring for men at all. I don't know if I believe that that is a difficult thing that we do. I think it's more difficult for folks to retract their care. I think it's more difficult for folks to um, be hostile, right? Like when you present, like when June Jordan's definition where she says, I will meet hostility with hostility, when Black women do do that, you get called a misandrous, you know? So <laughs> I don't know if I believe that that is as much as a problem as we think, but I also know that I don't have a big political investment in getting us to show love and care while we are being harmed. And so I don't think that many Black women struggle to embrace men or cis het men, let's say that. I think that what is happening is that Black feminists and womanists are not going to allow you to be violent in any capacity, right? They're not going to allow you to withhold patriarchal values. And I think that that's what folks are more so struggling with. But in terms of do we have to care show care or do we have to you know engage with everyone absolutely I do believe that um and so I know what I just said is very contradictory but there is something there about like yes we we are in community with with black men we are in community with each other and at the same time there are going to be women who have drawn very very um clear lines on what they are willing to accept because we are also living under patriarchy. And so I think that the question has to be turned back onto men in terms of like, what are they doing to get themselves to a place where they can be invited into these womanist and feminist spaces, right? What are they doing? That's the question. In terms of how does love show up for men in my own personal life, um, I'm very open to giving some of my workshops to cishet men if they're willing to learn from the standpoint that I teach from. I'm very open to that. Um, And there are men in my intimate life, whether it's romantically or platonically, who I see every single day. And so I think that that's a part of it. And then in terms of my political investments, you know, as an abolitionist and as somebody who has tried to extend abolition to our understandings of the healthcare system, that is also where um, men come into my analysis, right? So understanding the health impacts of anti-Blackness for men, their experiences in the healthcare system, um, their experiences 
with in prisons and all that, that's still a part of my work, right? I don't ignore that, but I will never lie to you all that I start with non-men and women and girls and children. I definitely won't lie about that. For as long as patriarchy exists, I'm starting with misogynoir. Thank you so much for that, Bria. Um, I'm gonna, there are a couple, few more questions, but really wanna get to a couple more because I know Bria has been, been chatting for a long time and don't wanna belabor your time, Bria, but really appreciate you and all that you're doing. Um, someone asked from our YouTube chat, and I want to shout out to Salika for uh, showing me this, this question. Um, in what ways can we as creatives and as women of color bond, grow, and learn from and support one another? Can you read that for me again, please? Yes. It says, in what ways can we as creatives and as women of color can, uh, what are we? What are ways we can bond, grow, and learn from, and and support one another? What are ways bond, grow, and support one another? <clears throat> yeah, I think again that ability to show tenderness to each other is one way. Um, creating spaces so that we can come together, whether it just be you know simple sister circles, whether it just be you know black feminists events, whether it be consciousness raising sessions, but really bringing, bringing each other back into each other's orbit and spending deliberate time with each other, like quality time is really, really important. Um, and then understanding how we can support each other in ways that defy this idea that our emotional needs um, are supposed to only be met through romance or specifically like heterosexual, cis heterosexual romance is really important. So figuring out all the ways we can defy that and still be in conscious community with each other and helping each other out and, and showing care and, you know, challenging mainstream ideas of intimacy. I think that's where we begin. Um, I think some of this work also needs to be done in reading, right? Like we need to read a bit more to understand the wide um, variety of issues that Black women and girls are facing. And so if we're going to be serious about understanding radical difference, we need to have a better understanding of what those differences are. And we need to be able to meet each other, not from a place of sameness, but from one of difference, like I said. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much um, for that. And the last question, um, someone asked, do you mind expanding more on the distinction between care and love? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think Bell Hooks is telling us that because we show care and like care can quite literally be like the labor of something because we are doing something for a person does not mean that we are loving them. So oftentimes in the parent and child relation, right, a parent, instead of saying, I love you, or instead of being accountable for the things that they've done wrong, they'll say, I clothe you. I take you to school every day. I make sure that you have food, you know, like these are ways that they're, they're showing care per se, right? Um, these are things that are a part of the informal, informal care economy, but that does not make them acts of love, but we think that they are. So we think because we did X, Y, and Z for a person that we love them. But if that were true, we wouldn't have so many children who grow up feeling unloved. We wouldn't have so many people in relationships that feel unloved, um, even though they're doing X, Y, and Z, right? So that Bell Hooks is saying, so if that is the case, then we got to figure out that just because we are caring does not mean that we are loving, right? And that those are two different things and that care is actually just a dimension of love. What I'm saying is that just you don't really need to love somebody to care for them. Um, that ethic, that that's a part of my care ethic, right? I don't need to love you and I don't exactly need to know you, but I understand our fundamental interdependence. And that is why those two things are different for me. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, we are at time, everyone. Um, 
and just want to say thank you so much, Shabria Johnson, for kicking off our 2022 School for Black Feminist Politics teachings. It's been such a joy to learn from you, Bria, and I know other people feel the same way. Um, and once again, these teachings will be available on YouTube, right? Um, the first teaching that Bria did on the transformative teachings of June Jordan is already up and, and you can watch it now. And this teaching will be available as well. We also have some forthcoming uh, reading lists that Bria has curated from her teachings, right? And so just really want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Bria. You are amazing, a brilliant. Just thank you for all that you do and for really getting us at the root uh, and, and really expanding our frame of reference of what a Black feminist, womanist political ethos of care and love can be or should be. Um, so just appreciate you so much. Thank you for having me, Jamie, and for embodying that care ethic every day. It's like you're such a reflection of it. Oh, wow. That's going to make me uh, hit a little tear, get a little tear. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you so much. And so um, I just want to read some of the comments. Thank you, Bria. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you for the space. I'll read whatever Bria wants me to. <laughs> yes, I'll read whatever Bria wants me to, too. Um, so thankful for this space and these teachings. Thank you so much, Bria. Oh, thank you, Jamie, and all the work you do. Thank you so much, y'all. We are so excited to have more teachings coming up. Um, and just grateful for the School for Black Feminist Politics. Please keep supporting Black women radicals in the school. And hopefully one day soon, we'll open up a physical space for the School for Black Feminist Politics so where we can, we can do this work safely and in person. So thank y'all so much um, and have an amazing rest of your day. Bria, thank you for, for doing this um, and just thank you for all you do. Bye y'all. Bye.